It's hard to do. Well, good morning and welcome to the Ministry of the Word service at Believer's Chapel. We are glad to see so many faces this morning, and we know we have others continuing to watch uh, from their homes, but it is great to be here and great to be with you this morning. I'm going to read from Psalm 33, verse 8. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke, and it came to be. He commanded, and it stood firm. The Lord brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. He frustrates the plans of the peoples. The counsel of the Lord stands forever, the plans of his heart to all generations. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people whom he has chosen as his heritage. Well, let's begin our ministry this morning with a hymn. That was lovely. One of the problems with wearing a mask is you can't see anybody smiling. So smile. I would love to see some smiles up here. We do have a lot to be uh, joyful about this morning. We're here to hear God's word, so uh, it's great to see. Well, we don't have a lot of new announcements. Most of these are repeats. Um, We are continuing to look for volunteers in the nursery as we open up, so if you would like to watch the little ones uh, during the service, please reach out to Sarah Terrell. Also, family camp reminder, it's coming up. We've, we've mentioned it almost every week. Hopefully, we are uh, getting people registered, and we'll have a full, a full group at Pine Cove. That'll be a lot of fun. Um, there really weren't any prayer requests. We had a praise. Esther and Carl Miller are rejoicing uh, from the result of uh, Carl's surgery. And then Josh and McCara Casey welcomed uh, baby Elizabeth on June 26. So that's a praise. Very difficult uh, to deliver a baby uh, during COVID, I'm sure. So uh, be sure and reach out to them. Well, that's all the announcements this morning. Uh, now Dan will come up and read our scripture for this morning. Dan. Thank you, Seth, and good morning. It's good to be back with you this Sunday morning. Um, I want to thank Jeff, who's here with us for uh, preaching last week. I enjoyed watching him on the uh, live feed and uh, seeing so many of you here. I think we've increased a little bit of our number this morning. But it's good to be back, and we're back in the Word of God. And um, next week, I'm starting a series on 2 Thessalonians. This week, I'm preaching a psalm. at Psalm 85. So turn with me to Psalm 85 and follow along as I read. <clears throat> O oh Lord, you showed favor to your land. You restored the captivity of Jacob. You forgave the iniquity of your people. You covered all their sin. You withdrew all your fury. You turned away from your burning anger. Restore us, O oh God of our salvation, and cause your indignation toward us to cease. Will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger to all generations? Will you not yourself revive us again, that your people may rejoice in you? Show us your loving kindness, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. I will hear what the Lord, what the, I will hear what God the Lord will say, for he will speak peace to his people, to his godly ones. But let let them not turn back to folly. Surely his salvation is near to those who fear him. That glory may dwell in our land. Loving kindness and truth have met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Truth springs from the earth and righteousness looks down from heaven. Indeed, the Lord will give what is good And our land will yield its produce. Righteousness will go before him. And he will make his footsteps into a way. May the Lord bless this reading of his word and bless our time in it together. Let's bow together in a word of prayer. Father, 
Father, what a blessing it is to be with your people on a Sunday morning, and it's uh, good to be regathering here in the way we're doing. It's uh, sort of small steps right now, but uh, we thank you that uh, we have this uh, beginning, and we're coming together, and I <clears throat> thank you for that, and pray you would bless us this morning, those here and those who are are watching from the live feed that uh, you would minister to each one of us. We begin with praise for you as the sovereign God who is seated on his throne. We praise you for that and know that uh, we can turn to you at any time with our requests and our needs and our words of praise. And we do so at this time in a difficult time in our, our history. There's a plague on the land, there is disturbance around us, and yet you are in control and we can look to you to bless. And we pray your blessing upon us that um, you would bless our health and protect us. And we think of some in particular who have uh, special uh, needs with that in regard to their uh, the pr procedures they've been going through. We pray for Madeline and Audrey and Betty and Margaret and others, Lord, who, who have uh, health issues, uh, protect them during this time. And we pray, Lord, that during these uh, turbulent times, you bless our leaders with wisdom. And we pray that you would bless our land with, uh, with peace uh, this is something that uh, you can do. And we know that everything that, that unfolds before us fits within your perfect plan and your will. But Lord, we pray that you might uh, bring about peace in this land and understanding and wisdom. And yet, Lord, we know the, the problems that we face are not political, they're not social, they're spiritual. And so, Lord, we pray that, that you would deal with that root problem and that through the ministry of the gospel, you would bless this land and not only this land, but the world with, uh, with uh, a great turning to you, a revival. And so, Lord, we pray that you'd use us to that end. And we pray that in our time together this morning, you might equip us for that and equip us for the, the week to come. But... Certainly, we equip us now with the, the issues that we have and the needs that we have, and I pray that you would equip us to go out and be lights in the midst of darkness. So we look to you to bless. Give us a good time of worship and, and study together, and we thank you for the, the possibility of it and the reason for it, which is found in your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for his death for us. and. Pray that he will be exalted in all that we do this morning. So bless us, Lord, now as we look to your word, and then bless us at the end of the hour as we take the Lord's Supper and remember our Lord's coming, his first coming and also his second coming, that he will return. And uh, we give you praise and thanks for that. Bless us now, Lord, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. It has been called the most famous passage in Methodist literature, the account in John Wesley's journal of his conversion. It happened on a Wednesday evening of May 24th, 1738, at a meeting in Aldersgate Street in London. A man was reading Martin Luther's preface to the book of Romans. Wesley wrote, at about a quarter before nine, while he was describing the change which God works in the heart through faith in Christ, I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt I did trust in Christ, Christ alone for salvation. Now, a heart strangely warmed is a wonderful experience. Spurgeon had a similar one when he was converted as a boy in a primitive Methodist chapel, he wrote, I thought I could dance all the way home. 
What's discouraging is when life becomes a grind and, and the joy or warmth we had early in life is missing. Fortunately, feelings aren't the test of true conversion. Even Wesley later wrote the question, where is the joy I knew when first I saw the Lord? A spiritually cold heart is not an uncommon experience in the Christian life. We all go through it. Still, the Holy Spirit who appeared, who appeared as fire on the day of Pentecost does warm hearts. He's the source of that. But what can we do? How do we regain spiritual vitality, warm hearts? Psalm 85 gives guidance. It is about that very problem of, of people who were discouraged and asking God to revive them. The psalm divides into four parts. Verses 1 through 3 recall past mercies. Verses 4 through 7 are a prayer for renewal. Verses 8 and 9 are about waiting for God to speak. And verses 10 through 13 anticipate blessing. The title of the psalm, what is written above the psalm for the choir director, a psalm of the sons of Korah, doesn't give the, uh, the historical setting for the psalm as uh, those titles sometimes do. But in verse 1, the psalm mentions being restored from captivity. And that suggests that the psalm was about those Jews who returned from the Babylonian captivity. That would put the psalm in the time of Ezra and Nehemiah. The Persian king Cyrus gave a decree that the Jews could return to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple. A remnant returned to their homeland. The work began with joy. Seventy years of captivity had ended. The Lord had forgiven them and restored their fortunes. But it wasn't long before they experienced opposition from enemies in the land. The temple was rebuilt, but with great difficulty. Then only after the, the, the Lord sent Nehemiah were the walls rebuilt. They were decades of setbacks and discouragement. In chapter 1 of Nehemiah, men from Judah came to Susa in Persia. And they told Nehemiah that the Jews in Jerusalem were in great trouble and disgrace. But through many dangers, toils, and snares, the, the people were corrected of their sins and failures. They were encouraged, and they finished their work. The temple and walls were rebuilt. Now that gives something of a pattern of our lives. We begin our Christian lives forgiven. We have new life. But then begins the work of rebuilding. And we have opposition. Opposition from the world and from the devil. The flesh is an impediment. Temptations arise. Distractions surround us. We have peace with God, but war with the world and within ourselves. And so... What might have begun with a heart strangely warmed becomes a heart grown cold, worldly, and spiritually indifferent. How do we recover? The psalmist has the answer. He begins the psalm by remembering the former days. O oh Lord, you showed favor to your land. You restored the captivity of Jacob. So it begins by remembering blessings of the past, the, the Lord's mercy. And from what follows in, in the next two verses indicates that the real blessing is not a return to the land, but forgiveness of sin. 
You forgave the iniquity of your people. You covered all their sin. You withdrew all your fury. You turned away from your burning anger. Now that's the blessing that the psalmist and those on whose behalf he spoke, the blessing that they valued. Forgiveness. Because apart from that, nothing really matters. Material blessings are real blessings. And we, we praise God and thank God for them, but they're temporal blessings. They don't last. It's the spiritual blessings that last. And the fundamental blessing of the spiritual blessings is forgiveness. The language here is the language of atonement. In verse 2, the psalmist says, the Lord forgave the iniquity. Uh, that's the idea, but it, it literally means something like to lift or to carry away their sin. Uh, that brings to mind Psalm 103, verse 12. The words are different, but the picture is similar. As far as the east is from the west, so far he has removed our transgressions from us. Our sin is gone. Our sin has been carried away. Our sin has been covered, no longer seen by the Lord. The reason is, it has been paid for. And in regard to their situation, that of the people of this psalm, historically, it was because the 70 years of payment had been made. The Lord's justice had been met. It had been satisfied. His wrath, therefore, had been turned, removed, and He was free to bless them. Now that gives us a picture of the cross and what Christ has done. By virtue of, of His death in our place, He carried away our sin. He has removed our sins from the Lord's sight, as it were, because He has paid for them. That's what His sacrificial death was. It was the payment for our transgressions. Now that is where we begin. The Lord has erased my past and made my future certain. Remembering that is the first step to being spiritually revitalized. It produces gratitude. It produces joy. The Lord has paid off all my debts. I'm free. The burden has been removed. We can't understand that and not rejoice. But remembering isn't the only means to spiritual recovery. I think it's the first step to that, but it's not the only step. Prayer is also essential. That occurs in verses 4 through 7, where the problem of estrangement, separation is revealed, and, and prayer for revival is made. Restore us, O God, of our salvation and... Cause your indignation toward us to cease. That first word, restore, is literally the word turn. It's a, a common word. In fact, I've referred to it more than once in, in recent uh, sermons and, and lessons. But it's a word that's often used of repentance. It's a great word for that. Repentance is, is a turning of the mind. It is turning from... Uh, unbelief to belief. It's returning from sin to obedience. But uh, that, that's this word, and it's used, for example, uh, very significantly, I think, in, in terms of helping us understand its meaning in Jeremiah 31, verse 18. Bring me back that I may be restored. The King James Version gives a more literal translation of that. Turn now me, and I shall be turned. The idea is, give me repentance and I will repent. And I think that may be the idea here. It suggests that, that sin may have been involved in causing their, their hearts to grow cold. That, that was a problem in the days of Ezra and Nehemiah. They had been, there had been intermarriage between Jews and the Gentiles of the land. In fact, some of the priests and Levites were among the offenders. So Ezra went to the temple and he prayed about that issue, that problem, and then he came and corrected the people severely. And the people responded. They responded with weeping and repentance. 
Maybe that is the background uh, for this in the psalm, or something like it. Forgiveness doesn't mean we become sinless. Sin in God's people results in spiritual estrangement and coldness. And also, coldness of heart results in sin. We need daily repentance. So the psalmist prays for the people. Restore us. Turn us. Give us repentance so that we will repent and your indignation toward us will cease. Restoration is the desire. But it's all predicated on grace. Sovereign grace. Why pray otherwise? We pray because we know that we can't do it. We need help. We need God's sovereign grace to work within us. And then we will work. So we see the problem and we look to the Lord for the solution. That's the essence of prayer. And and this prayer, you can tell, is earnest prayer. The psalmist prayer isn't a mere formality. It's not like reading some liturgy. This is heartfelt prayer, desperate prayer prayer. Verses 5 and 6. Will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger to all generations? Will you not yourself revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? That's what they want. That's what the psalmist wants and he's speaking for the people rejoicing in the Lord. Derek Kidner wrote that the questions asked here virtually answer themselves. And the answers are, you won't be angry forever, and you will revive us. The psalmist knew that, and he spoke it with confidence, or there's confidence suggested in his questions, because he knew the Lord's character. He knew, as Kidner stated, that judgment is God's strange and alien work in which He takes no pleasure. Well, that's what uh, the Lord said in Ezekiel 18, verse 32. He takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. He, He would rather the wicked repent and live. We see that in the prophecy of Joel chapter 2, verse 25. I will make up to you for the years that the swarming locusts have eaten. We were talking before the service, and you may have read this, that there's a plague of locusts that has been in uh, Western Asia, sweeping through East Africa, and it is a vast number of locusts that just come down and eat all of the crops. Well, it was a common thing in the ancient Near East. Uh, Today, we have means of controlling them, and those means broke down, evidently, in this particular plague, but they didn't have that then, and it was a great scourge in, in the, the, the ancient times. And so this was quite a, a, a beautiful prophecy, a significant, vivid prophecy of, of the things that have been wasted in life. It's like locusts eating them up, but the prophecy that's given here is one that God is going to restore what has been lost. A sovereign God is going to restore blessing to these people. James Boyce wrote, Sin causes us to lose many blessings. These cannot be recovered. They are gone. But God can give new opportunities and new blessings. If you turn back to the Lord, the Lord will turn to you and restore what the the locusts have eaten. That's the nature and the character of the Lord God. The psalmist knew that. He he may even have known Joel's prophecy. And so, based on that knowledge of the Lord, the psalmist confidently makes another request in verse 7. Show us your loving kindness, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. Loving kindness is a great word. It's the word hesed. I say that because I think many of you are familiar with that word. It's sometimes translated loyal love. It's 
It is covenantal love. It is the love that the Lord has for His people. It is unconditional love. It is unfailing love. This is what the psalmist pleads for before the Lord. He, he, didn't, he didn't recall or claim the people's goodness or their resolve to reform their lives. Man's best intentions are weak and prone to fail. In fact, they always fail when done in man's own strength. But the Lord's loving kindness never fails. That's what the psalmist seeks. It's the prayer of the tax collector in the temple in Luke chapter 18, where he beats his breast and he says, Oh God, be merciful to me, the sinner. I deserve nothing is what he's saying. I plead for mercy. And that's what we need. He hears that prayer because he is merciful and loves to act in loving kindness. That's how we are to pray. Like this psalmist prays, reminding God of his character, reminding him of his glorious attributes, his grace and promises. He doesn't need to be reminded because he forgets. He knows it all, but he wants to hear it from us. And as we pray that and we recall these things about him, he acts upon them. Well, that's what the psalmist has done. So what now? He has recalled God's past blessings and he has prayed. He asked God for more mercy and help. What more can he do? He can wait on the Lord. And that's what he does next in verses 8 and 9. I will hear what God the Lord will say, for he will speak peace to his people, to his godly ones. Waiting is hard to do. It's a test. It, it tries our patience. And we can only, only guess at how the Lord's answer would have come to the psalmist, maybe through a prophet or direct revelation. The Lord doesn't speak to us that way today. He speaks to us through His Word, the Bible, through the Scriptures, as we, we read them and study them. And, and also He speaks to us, He answers us through providence when circumstances or difficulties are removed. The Lord has count, countless ways of doing that. We need to pray, and we need to wait on Him. Uh, that applies to, to this specific issue of, of revival and uh, regaining fervency for the Lord. We, we find this all through the Psalms, this, this longing for a renewed relationship with the Lord, which doesn't happen immediately. For example, uh, in, in Psalm 6, David prayed, Be gracious to me, O Lord, for I am pining away. And he had been pining away for some time. He had been seeking the Lord's blessing for some time. He's, he was weary with sighing and spoke of making his bed swim and dissolving his couch with tears. So this is a protracted problem. This is an issue that's been going on. And we, we learned from the psalm that the problem was sin. It was only after a period of time of crying out to the Lord in His distress and, and waiting that the answer came. The relationship was renewed and vitality restored. So this is not something that always occurs immediately. It may, but it doesn't always occur immediately. It involves prayer and patience and persistence. And maybe sometimes the delay occurs for the purpose of trying our patience. We're strengthened through the trials that we go through. And that happens sometimes in order to teach us something, that we might know how vitally important a relationship with the Lord really is. And we learn that by being in the wilderness for a while, by going through distress for a while. And it strengthens our faith as we continue to come before the Lord. And then when we see His hand of blessing, um, we rejoice all the more and know the great 
blessing of it all the more clearly. But the psalmist knew the Lord would answer. That the Lord will speak peace to His godly ones. He says in verse 9, Surely His salvation is near to those who fear Him, that glory may dwell in our land. If we're correct in understanding the historical situation, then the temple had been rebuilt, but the presence of the Lord wasn't experienced as it was in, say, the days of Solomon when the Shekinah glory filled the temple and they had a a visual uh, understanding of, of the Lord's presence. Still, the psalmist expressed confidence that the Lord would answer his prayer that His glory would dwell among them. And uh, as he prayed that, he may not have known how the Lord would do that and how that would occur. But perhaps in this is the suggestion of of the Lord's incarnation and, and Christ dwelling in the land and bringing salvation to Israel when He came. John chapter 1, verse 14, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. What applies to us is the psalmist's confidence that it will happen. However it happens, however this dwelling and this blessing occurs, it will happen. And and we should have that confidence as well. We need to learn to wait on the Lord, to, to patiently petition Him. He always answers. He always answers His people, but He answers them And He answers us in His time and in His way. Well, that takes patience. It takes waiting on the Lord. Now, that confidence that He had leads Him to look ahead in verse 10 with anticipation to a glorious age promised by the prophets in which all His concerns will be answered and met. Loving kindness and truth have met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Truth springs from the earth and righteousness looks down from heaven. That's a description of a future time when all will be well between heaven and earth. But verse 10 is is often quoted in reference to the cross and what happened through Christ's sacrifice. I'm not sure that that is the specific reference the the psalmist was making here, but it does state well what happened there at the cross and and, and that does fit, I think, the context because the peace to come that he anticipates and that I think uh, occupies the thought of the psalmist in the last verses of this psalm, that peace comes based on what Christ did on the cross. This is the only reason that we can have a relationship with the Lord God and have peace with the Lord God. It's what John wrote about in 1 John chapter 4, verse 10. In this is love. Not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Propitiation simply means turning away wrath by an offering. And Christ's offering turned away the Father's wrath from us because His death satisfied God's justice fully, which then freed His love to forgive us of our sins and make us His children. In the cross of Christ, justice and mercy met, or as the psalmist put it, righteousness and peace have kissed each other. We have God's peace because Christ suffered God's righteous justice for us. Now, at the moment of faith, at the moment of faith, every believer in Christ has peace with God. He's no longer our judge. He's our Father. As a result of that, we have the peace of God. And that's our daily relationship with others and fundamentally with the Lord Himself. We have inner peace. Now, we can never lose our peace with God. 
But we can lose the peace of God because of sin or distractions or the encroachment of the world into our lives. That's what happened to Israel and is what the psalmist sought to have restored. The peace, the joy, the the spiritual vitality they once had known. What gives him hope, at least what gives him hope here at this point in the psalm, that it, it will be restored, is his knowledge of the future. That God's plan for the world is to fill it with truth and righteousness. Then there will be no disruption in our relationship. Psalm concludes, indeed, the Lord will give what is good and our land will yield its produce. Righteousness will go before him and will make his footsteps into a way. And we will follow in his footsteps. He will guide us at every moment of our existence. That's the future. So it's the promise of complete harmony between God and man. A state of both material and spiritual prosperity. It's what Peter promised the people in Acts chapter 3 verses 19 through 21. He told them to repent so that times of refreshing may come when, when the Lord will send Christ and there will be the period of restoration of all things. Which the prophets spoke of from ancient times. Now that's Israel's kingdom, which we are a part of as, as co-heirs, equal partners with them since we have been grafted into Israel's olive tree. That's Romans 11, verse 17. That's our hope. The kingdom to come, glory and blessing and uninterrupted fellowship with the Lord and an ever-growing relationship with Him without hindrance in a world without end. And that may have given the psalmist reason to expect the Lord's blessing now and the answer to his prayer in this experience, in this life. Since fellowship with us is God's purpose for the future, it is certainly his desire for us in the present. But also, the, the certainty of the kingdom to come is reason for joy in the Lord. He has a glorious future planned for the faithful, for those who love Him. That, that should give us excitement for Him, excitement about Him, excitement in our relationship with Him, and excitement about our future. All of this psalm gives us a pattern or prescription for restoration to joy and spiritual vitality. We see it in the four parts of the psalm. It begins with reflection on the Lord's past mercies, His faithfulness, then prayer for restoration, and thirdly, waiting on the Lord, listening for His answer to us, and then thinking about our future the glory to come, world without end. The basis for all of this, especially re reflecting on the Lord's pa past blessings and hoping in the future promises, the basis for all of that, for our present blessing, our condition, our, our union with Christ, our relationship with Him, and our glorious future, the basis is Scripture. It's knowing and thinking about God's Word. That's, that's really what brings about a revitalized life. The only way we will ever regain lost joy and vitality in our spiritual life is through reading and meditating on the Word of God. And I know that sounds basic, and it's probably something I, I repeat often. I know I repeat Romans 10, verse 17 frequently, but it applies. Faith comes from hearing, and hearing by the Word of Christ. Do you want a stronger faith? Do you want a more knowledgeable and wise life? 
Read the Word of God. Study it. It comes from hearing the Word of Christ. And we can add to faith being strengthened, joy. All of the fruit of the Spirit for that matter. It all comes from hearing the Word of Christ. Think of the, uh, the two disciples on the Emmaus Road in Luke 24. They were returning home from Jerusalem following the Sabbath after the crucifixion. They were hopeless and depressed. Christ was dead. All they'd hoped for was gone. That's when Christ, unknown to them, came to them and spoke to them as they walked together. And this stranger to them began to explain to them the Scriptures. And from the Scriptures, he explained to them the necessity of the crucifixion and resurrection, something they should have known because Christ had repeated it throughout His ministry to His disciples. But He unfolds the Scriptures to them. And when He did reveal Himself to them and, and then disappeared, they said, were not our hearts burning within us while He was speaking to us on the road, while He was explaining the Scriptures to us? This is why from the, from the very beginning, Satan, the great disruptor of faith and life, questioned the integrity of God's Word. First thing, first appearance in the Bible in Genesis 3, that's what he does. He did that in the garden. Indeed, has God said, he asked Eve. He was telling her, don't believe it. It's not true. God's intentions toward you are not good. They're selfish. And his attack on divine revelation on Scripture has continued to this very day. He wants to keep us out of the Bible because in it are the, the seeds of life. It nourishes our souls and transforms our lives from glory to glory. That's how Paul described it in 2 Corinthians 3 verse 18. As we read the Word of God, the Spirit of God applies it to us. We don't feel it. We don't sense it. But it happens. Just as we, we nourish our body physically, materially with, with food, we don't experience the, the change that takes place, but it's going on. And so it is with the Word of God and the Spirit ministering together and applying the Scriptures to us. Knowing Scripture is vital for the Christian life. I, I know I don't need to repeat that to you, say that to you. Now there's something else here. It's not actually said, but seen. And it's the example of the psalmist. He was ministering to Israel through the psalm, giving instruction, counsel, and encouragement. That's what all of this is for God's people. And that's what we're to be doing. That, that's the fellowship we give one another in times of discouragement to help rekindle spiritual vitality, to warm hearts that have grown cold. One of the great examples of that in the church is John Newton and the help he gave to his friend William Cooper. Cooper was a man with a fragile disposition, prone to bouts of depression. As a young man, he attempted suicide. He failed only because the rope broke. He was institutionalized, and, and in God's providence, that is where he met a minister who led him to Christ and salvation. Still, he was a sensitive soul, and he struggled the rest of his life. That's... That's just reality. Sometimes the, the, the Christian has a burden, like a thorn in the flesh, and he or she has to deal with these burdens for a long time. And so it was with William Cooper. But again, in the providence of God, he met John Newton, who ministered to him. Both were hymn writers. Newton gave us amazing grace, and Cooper wrote, God moves in a mysterious way, and there is a fountain filled with blood. They were part of a collection of hymns called the Olney Hymns, 
O-L-N-E-Y, written in the town of Olney, where Newton was the minister and where Cooper moved to be near him. And he lived as his neighbor, lived right next door. The time of him writing was a great blessing to Cooper and, and his mental stability. They would go on daily walks and talk about the Lord. But after about 10 years, Cooper suffered a major breakdown. He again, attempted suicide. Newton was there to help him. The Newtons took him into their home and they cared for him daily. Even after moving to London for a new ministry, Newton kept in touch. They exchanged letters for the next 20 years and Cooper poured out his heart to Newton who never stopped being William Cooper's friend and helper and counselor. Another of the hymns uh, John Newton wrote and that we sing is Pensive, Doubting, Fearful Heart. I can't but wonder if he wrote that to encourage Cooper because it fits his condition and met his need. The first verse is, Pensive, Doubting, Fearful Heart, Hear what Christ the Savior says. Every word should joy impart. Change thy mourning into praise. Yes, he speaks and speaks to thee. May he help thee to believe. Then thou presently wilt see thou hast little cause to grieve. What does he say to us? He speaks to us in Psalm 85 and he says, Your sins have all been covered and my burning anger has been turned away forever. At the cross, loving kindness and truth have met, justice and mercy have kissed. I have a glorious future for you forever and now in the present. I am with you, always with you, and always want fellowship with you. So thou hast little cause to grieve. Knowing that, understanding God's loving kindness and grace, His forgiveness, should cause a heart to be strangely warmed. If you're here without Christ, it cannot be said, thou hast little cause to grieve. You have every reason to grieve. You have unforgiven sin to grieve over. And an eternal future of paying for it. These are serious words. This is your condition outside of Christ. And so the counsel that I give to you is escape. Live. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. He receives everyone who turns to Him, who comes to Him. And may God help all of us to consider the psalm we've, we've read and the, the counsel of the psalmist to remember what the Lord has done for us, the mercy that He has shown to us, to pray for revival within us and wait for the Lord and and anticipate the blessings that are coming in this life and throughout all eternity. God help us to do that. Let's bow in a word of prayer. And as I pray, I'm going to ask the Lord to prepare our hearts for the Lord's Supper as well. So let's bow together in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for your goodness to us. And we thank you for the, the psalm and the counsel that it gives us. We confess that so often our hearts do grow cold for various reasons. Maybe that uh, the routine of life gets to us. But so often it's because we, we somehow move away from your word or from the fellowship of the saints. And um, we're in a time where that could be easily done with this assembly, this church. And I pray that you would keep us all in fellowship with one another, and most importantly, in your word, studying it and reflecting upon you and in prayer and walking with you. So bless us, Lord. 
And when we, we have a sense that, uh, that there's some distance, that is a warning sign. That's a red flag. Help us to respond to it and to look to you and to seek your blessing, your help, your revival as the psalmist did and, and, and wait upon you and know that you're faithful to us. We thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for what he's done for us, how justice and mercy kissed in the cross and we have forgiveness through his work on our behalf and life, eternal life. Thank you for that. Lord, as we prepare our hearts for taking the Lord's Supper and remembering Him, we pray that the Spirit of God would minister to us and that He would prepare us. Cause us to reflect deeply upon who Your Son is, what He's done for us, and remember that it's all out of Your great love for us that He came and did His work. We thank You for Him, and it's in His name we pray. Amen. Dan closed uh, his message by exhorting us to remember uh, when we observe the Lord's Supper, we participate in an act of remembrance. You know that. We've been talking about that quite a bit the last few weeks. Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. What we are to remember is to be contemplated in what the bread and the wine represent, the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ given as an atoning sacrifice for our sin. But there is also a sense in which we must remember uh, who we are as we participate. There would have been no need for God to send his son into the world or for his son uh, to die were it not for our condition before him. As Jonathan Edwards proclaimed so long ago, we are sinners in the hands of an angry God. Our sin has riled up, so to speak, the anger of God. And the psalmist, uh, from whom uh, we have just heard, has expressed himself as uh, one member of many people who are subject to the, these are the words from the, the psalm, the, the fury, the burning anger, the indignation of God the Lord. Anger is a human emotion as well, and though there is such a thing as righteous anger in God's people, I think we would all admit that our anger typically expresses itself more as a, a self-centered, uh, emotional failure to control ourselves. And so the Bible teaches us that God can be angry at His anger is not so much an emotion as it is a just and righteous response to the provocation of sin. And furthermore, as our psalm has shown, though God does judge, he's also made promises and he is faithful to those promises. He will speak peace to his people. Loving kindness and truth have met together. Righteousness and peace have uh, kissed each other. Well, in the New Testament, uh, one of the clearest and most profound expressions of the anger of God, just, just juxtaposed with such loving kindness and peace, is found in the Apostle Paul's exposition of the condition of man and the glorious salvation of God in the first few chapters of the epistle to uh, the Romans. Paul is eager, you recall, uh, to instruct the church in the beauty and profundity of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So early on in the first chapter, he tells them that he is not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of salvation for all those who believe because in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. But that's quickly followed, remember, uh, by his laying out of the very need of salvation. It is that the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and righteous, unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in, in God's right, in righteousness, unrighteousness. So there's God's anger again, uh, his wrath. And Paul goes on to draw that 
truth out through the end of the first chapter and then through the entirety of the second chapter and deep into the, the third chapter of the book of Romans until at last he again returns to the subject of the gospel with one of his signature but now declarations. Chapter 3, verse 21. But now, apart from law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe, for there is no distinction. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption, which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiatory sacrifice in his blood through faith. That's exactly what every uh, sinner uh, needs. It is to be justified. Uh, That is to be declared righteous through the ransoming work of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross, paying the price to free us from our condemnation because of our sin, uh, bringing to us a peace We don't deserve because in and of ourselves we cannot satisfy a righteous God's righteous demands. Only God's perfect son could satisfy and bear the just penalty for our sin by offering himself as an atoning sacrifice for our sins in our place. To use the apostles' uh, language, Jesus Christ propitiated the Father by shedding his blood on the cross, allaying his righteous anger. And all this uh, because of his great love for us, a love we now contemplate as we come to his table to take of this bread and of this uh, wine and remember uh, what it represents, uh, the body and blood of Jesus, our Savior. On the evening he was betrayed, Jesus took bread and broke it and gave it to his disciples. He said, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So we invite all who belong to him, who by grace have trusted in his person and work alone to assuage our loving and righteous Lord's anger at sin to celebrate such a great salvation by participating now in his supper. Well, let me give thanks uh, for the bread. Father, how thankful we are for the good news that we have heard today. Uh, Thank you for the past blessings that we uh, really revel in, and yet as Dan has reminded us, as the scriptures have reminded us, we do have... Uh, occasion too often uh, to fall away, uh, to uh, lose the warmth of a fellowship and a relationship with you. And so thank you for this Lord's Supper uh, that is a, a, a ministry that you have given to us uh, to pause now and think of the great love you have for us and the blessing of salvation in very God of very God, your own precious son who came into this world and was obedient to you and gave himself as this sacrifice in our place so that we might have not suffer uh, your just penalty, your righteous wrath against our sin. As we partake of this bread, Lord, I pray that each of us would do that uh, with that firmly in our minds and in our hearts. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to read from Revelation chapter 1, verses 4 through 7, and make uh, some brief comments. John to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn 
of the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and released us from our sins by his blood. And he has made us to be a kingdom, priests to his God and Father. To him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. So it is to be. Amen. This is a greeting from the Trinity. God the Father is him, or is he who is and was and is to come, the eternal one. The Holy Spirit is the seven spirits, a reference to the perfection and and completeness of his power. But the emphasis here is on the second person of the Trinity, the Lord Jesus Christ, in verses 5 through 8. He is the one who loves us, and released us from our sins by His blood. That's what I want to look at briefly. Notice the present tense. He loves us. Now and always, constantly, He loves us. He loves His people. Nothing, no sin can separate us from Him. And it is all because He loved us in the past, and gave himself up for us. That's what John describes next, and released us, or loosed us, from our sins by his blood. That is where he bought us, that is where he redeemed us, that is where the issue was settled, and our salvation was gained. The cross was the payment that paid all our debts. It was the victory. The cross was not a defeat. It was the victory. And the resurrection is the proof that God the Father accepted His Son's sacrifice. And just as He said, it was finished. And the result is, He made us a kingdom and priests. We are all priests to God. Under the Old Covenant, as you know, that office was restricted to a special class of men, those of the tribe of Levi, and a particular group within the family of Levi, those descended from Aaron. So it was restricted, but now all believers, male and female, are priests. We can enter into the Holy of Holies of Heaven at any time, not just once a year as was the case in ancient Israel, but at any time, any day, all the time, we're invited to come boldly to the throne of grace with our prayers, with our praise. We can make petitions for ourselves and to others and know that the Lord God of the universe hears us and answers. We are priests, and this is our priestly ministry as we take the Lord's Supper and we worship Him. So we're priests and we are kings. He calls us a kingdom here, but it's clear from other passages that we are kings. Chapter 5, verse 10, and chapter 20, verse 4 tells us that we will reign with Christ on the earth. And that day is coming. Verse 7, Behold, He is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see Him, even those who pierced Him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. So it is to be. Amen. There is chaos in the land today. We're very much aware of that. But really, there's always been spiritual chaos and turmoil in this world. And so it will be until our Lord comes. But when he comes, in his second coming, he will bring peace to the earth. He will settle things. He will reign And we will reign with Him because of what He did at His first coming when He shed His blood and made His sacrifice for His people. Well, that's what we celebrate here on a Sunday morning. 
That's what we celebrate as we take the bread, and now as we take the wine, we recall that violent but efficacious sacrifice that he made for us at Calvary. Let's give thanks for the cup. Father, we do thank you for the cup that recalls to us and symbolizes the blood that your son shed, blood of the God-man. It was infinite in its value, sufficient for an infinite number of people, but efficient for your people. You saved us at the cross. And so, Lord, help us to reflect deeply upon that in these moments as we take the cup and recall the great sacrifice he made for us. We thank you for it. Thank you for sending him into this world. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for dying for us. And we thank you, Holy Spirit, for drawing us irresistibly to faith in him. We thank you for your sovereign grace, Lord, in Christ's name. Amen. Well, that concludes our service for this Sunday morning. It's so good to see all of you here. I hope to see you back next week and perhaps others as well. Um, let's end with a word of prayer and pray the Lord's blessing on us for the week. Father, we, we do that. We pray that you would bless us this week. Keep us safe. Keep us healthy. And we pray, Lord, that very soon we'll be able to meet here all together and uh, fellowship again fully. Thank you for what your son has done for us at the cross, as we've just remembered. May we live lives that bring honor to him. We pray these things in Christ's name. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. Pray in the Lord's name. Amen. Keep looking to Christ. We'll see you next week.